welcome back to Off the Deaton Path. My name is Stan Deaton with the Georgia Historical Society, and we welcome you to this podcast for the week of November 7, 2018. This week, my very special guest is author and historian David Blight. David is class of 1954 professor of history at Yale University, and he is also the director of the Gilder Lehrman Center for the Study of Slavery, Resistance, and Abolition at Yale. David is one of the foremost historians of the era of the Civil War, as well as slavery and emancipation, and he has written extensively on those subjects, as well as on history and memory. He is the author of numerous articles, essays, and books, including Race and Reunion, The Civil War in American Memory, published in 2001 by Harvard University Press, which received eight book awards, including the prestigious Bancroft Prize, the Lincoln Prize, and the Frederick Douglass Prize. His other published works include American Oracle, The Civil War and the Civil Rights Era, published by Harvard in 2011, a book of essays entitled Beyond the Battlefield, Race, Memory, and the American Civil War, published by the University of Massachusetts Press in 2002, and Frederick Douglass's Civil War, Keeping Faith in Jubilee, published by LSU Press in 1989. David Blight was in Savannah to be inducted as the Georgia Historical Society's inaugural Vincent J. Dooley Distinguished Teaching Fellow. The Dooley Distinguished Fellows Program has been established by the GHS Board of Curators and is supported by an endowment funded by friends and admirers of Vince Dooley. Individuals designated as Dooley Distinguished Teaching Fellows of the Society are national leaders in the field of history as both writers and educators, whose research has enhanced or changed the way the public understands the past. In addition to their outstanding scholarship, Dooley Distinguished Teaching Fellows have served the Georgia Historical Society as faculty and teacher training seminars, as lecturers, as consultants, or in a similar capacity. Being designated as a duly distinguished fellow recognizes and formalizes the relationship forged through this service. David Blight was in Savannah to receive this distinction and to talk about his latest book, a path-breaking new biography entitled Frederick Douglass, Prophet of Freedom, published in October 2018 by Simon & Schuster. This interview was conducted at the Jepson House Education Center at the Georgia Historical Society on November 8, 2018. Here's David Blight. David, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Stan. It's great to be back in Savannah. Now, Frederick Douglass does not really have a Georgia connection, but your book certainly has a Savannah connection, so I'd like for you to tell our readers uh, the story of the Evans Collection. The book has a deep Savannah connection, and you and Todd here at the Georgia Historical Society are responsible for it. And what I now have learned was 2006, uh, I came here to give a speech or a talk uh, that you invited me to do to a local group of high school and middle school teachers. That day you told me there was a local collector, a local gentleman, who would like to meet and maybe have lunch. We had lunch, and that's when I met um, Walter Evans. Uh, And Walter took us back to his house. Uh, and Walter has, and still has, an extraordinary collection of Frederick Douglass documents, uh, family papers, uh, and then some. Uh, the collection consists at its heart of about nine or ten huge family scrapbooks that were kept by Douglass's sons over the last 30 to 35 years of their father's life. That day, when I saw that collection, I realized somebody should probably therefore attempt a new biography of Douglas. I had written my first book on Douglas back when, out of graduate school. I had edited editions of his autobiographies. I had written essays on Douglas and so forth. Uh, it took me a little while, as I recall, to work it through, but I realized that uh, if I didn't attempt this new biography based on the Evans collection, uh, then someone else would. So there's simply no question I would not have done this new biography of Douglas had I not encountered the Evans collection that you introduced me to. And and just for the record, um, that was March 10th, 2006. <laughs> we'll get that down. But also, uh, Walter Evans is a retired surgeon and right. a collector of African-American art and, and bibliography. He is indeed. Walter grew up here in segregated Savannah, but he went north for his higher education. And he went to the University of Michigan Medical School and then practiced as a surgeon in Detroit for over 30 years. 
And it's then in the 1970s uh, and, and later that he began to collect uh, rare books, manuscripts, and art. Uh, Walter's probably more famous indeed for his art collection mm. than even the rest of the material, but he, he owns an extraordinary rare book collection of African-American writers, and then he owns an extraordinary manuscript collection. Um, and I have been now to Savannah more weeks and days than I can even count. I've spent at least four spring breaks here, uh, and then many other weeks uh, in the summers and other times doing research over on Jones Street on Walter and Linda Evans' dining room table. Uh, it is in some ways the most uh, unusual and wonderful archive I've ever worked in. <laughs> um, they used to tell me just... Don't come before 8 a.m., but uh, uh, coffee will be on, and I was welcome to stay as long as I wanted, and I did sometimes, way into the evening, uh, for a week at a time, uh, working in these scrapbooks and the other material. It's not just scrapbooks. There are a lot of family letters, photographs, and other unusual documents that a family would collect about itself. And the, the, the truly important aspect of that collection, particularly for me as a biographer, was that it illuminated, it, it opened up Douglas's later life, the older Douglas, the aging Douglas, the patriarch Douglas, um, in ways we had never seen before. If, if, if readers or if the average person knows anything about Frederick Douglas, it tends to be the young heroic Douglas who escaped from slavery and wrote his narrative and became a famous orator. But in the 30 years after the Civil War, Douglas's life, if anything, is even more fascinating, more complicated. Uh, he, he, he grows from the radical outsider, the radical abolitionist, transformed in the Civil War and, and then in emancipation into a, a political insider. Uh, he becomes a Republican Party insider. He, he never holds an elective office in those last 30 years of his life, but he held three federal appointments in Washington, D.C. Uh, and his, his extended family, uh, three surviving sons, one surviving daughter, 21 grandchildren, and then even a few fictive kin, fictive siblings indeed, who adopted him or whom he adopted, they all became, in effect financially dependent on Douglas. And the Evans Collection uh, opened that up. It became a window into that world, uh, in part because it's just this almost unbelievable collection of newspaper clippings, thousands of them, but also because of the family letters that are in that collection. And it made it possible to understand the aging and the older Douglas much, much better than we ever had have before. Uh, there are all kinds of insights that I got from the Evans collection, and we could talk about any any number of them. Well, I remember well the afternoon that you first saw these, and I remember your your shock and surprise at what you were seeing. Do you re do you recollect what it was that you saw that made you think this is something special? This isn't just somebody's got a collection of documents. This is. Did you know immediately that there was a window here that no one had looked through? I think I did, but it's hard to remember that first time because I've been back so many other times. Yeah, sure. And I spent so many hours looking through Well, well let me material. ask you this. Then. How, uh, do we but, know if anybody's ever used this collection, historian or biographer? Yeah, I, I don't think... I was not the first to see the collection, but I, I do believe I was the first to seriously use it. There now have been several other Douglas do, scholars. Do we know... Do we know how they got from Douglas's children yeah, to, no. to Jones? No, and I don't think Walter knows the early provenance of the collection either. He bought most of it from other collectors. Okay. Well, in fact, he bought all of it from other collectors, much of it from the same collector. And where that collector got it, I don't know. How this material ended up moving from the Douglas family uh, the aging sons of Frederick Douglass and possibly his daughter. Maybe some of it was in the possession of Helen Pitts, Douglass' second wife, but I have no evidence of that. But how it got from Douglass' actual children then to possibly grandchildren and then was sold or given away, I do not know. Mm -hmm. 
it would be fascinating to know. All these kinds of collections have a provenance of some kind, um, but it ended up in the hands of private collectors, and that's where it still is. Right. Um, how long did you work on the book? Well, I worked on the book then, if it's 2006, <laughs> on and off for 12 years. I did other things along the way. Mm -hmm. uh, in 2006, I was writing a book called A Slave No More, which was published, I think, in 2008. Mm -hmm. uh, I also did a book called American Oracle, which was about writers, several important writers during the civil rights era and about the Civil War in the Civil Rights era called American Oracle. Published that in 2011. So I was doing these other works, but I was also at the same time coming down here to Savannah. I, I, I came every year. Uh, I don't think there was a year in this process that I didn't come here at least once. Um, and even toward the end of the process uh, in 2015, 14, 15, 16, 17, uh, I kept thinking I was finished, and I wasn't finished. I always had notes I wrote myself, well, go back to that scrapbook, go back to this scrapbook, go back to that part of the collection, because you didn't really finish with it, you didn't really get through it. And that's always the story with research, it never feels quite finished, but I finally did have to call it finished at one point. Although even in the middle of writing it, uh, and the, 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 the actual writing went on over a period of four years, um, uh, easily four years, I still made trips back down here to see this part or that part of the collection. And I would also add that these are massive 19th century scrapbooks. They're not easy to photocopy. And in fact, they're almost impossible to photocopy because you can't put them on a machine. I was therefore at first trying to simply type everything I was reading. I was old-fashioned. I then started taking photographs with a, a little digital camera, although I must admit I never perfected that very well. But I have hundreds of pages of type notes on the laptop, which I then print up um, from the Evans collection, which uh, I suppose is the most valuable piece of research I've ever done. Um, but... Um, I don't know that I understood it the very moment I saw it. What I did understand the moment I saw it is that this is an amazing collection of material about Douglas's domestic life and his public life because of the, the uh, array of, of clippings. And I should add, too, mm -hmm. the family, or the sons, somewhere in the mid-1880s, Douglas lives until 1895, they hired a clipping service that was called the American Bureau. And what you find in these scrapbooks are just hundreds of clippings that were actually produced by a paid clipping service. So that everywhere Douglas went on his endless speaking tours, a clipping would come back, generally from that town. If he spoke in a little town in Indiana, there's a clipping from there. And what it, what it, what it allows the biographer is what a biographer is always looking for. Texture. Anecdotes. That you could, with which you can tie together a narrative of a person's life. Uh, and that, that Evans collection is just full of these kinds of specific uh, pieces of texture. Uh, an interview he did there, a speech he gave in this town that had this local reaction. And I should add, I never understood that Douglas did as much speaking in the Deep South. Uh, after the Civil War, by the 1880s. He did. He even came through Savannah. Mm -hmm. I learned that from clippings in the Evans collection. He spoke in rural Georgia. He went all the way to Florida. He later spoke again in, uh, from Georgia across to Alabama. He made one trip all the way to New Orleans. Um, he spoke in Thomasville, Georgia. Thomasville, Georgia. And there's even a clipping that 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 records Douglas supposedly uh, going into a kind of southern black dialect to speak to this crowd of mm. free people who had been slaves. Uh, that's the sort of material that, that allows you to tell stories within a biography. Um, and I must say, too, one of the things I learned in writing this biography is that, especially with a person who was such a prolific writer and speaker as Douglas, it never feels finished. 
a life like this, and for that matter, all of our lives, are always kind of infinite in a sense. Uh, if we know all of this about someone's life, what else can we know? If we know, if we think we know everything about your life, what else could we know? You know, if we looked here or looked there, or ask this or ask that. So this book never felt finished; it just had to get finished. <laughs> and so, yeah, yes, and and so. These clippings, I mean, theoretically, one would suppose if all these newspapers existed on microfilm, a mm-hmm. biographer could travel many miles no, and look at miles no, of microfilm. But no, the no, truth is, point. they don't. They don't exist no, on no, microfilm. They're, these are these are hundreds of local newspapers. Uh, some of them do exist, in, 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 in the Suns were even clipping from the major Washington D.C. papers, the major mm-hmm. New York papers, mm-hmm. Philadelphia papers, and so on and so on. But local newspapers from Georgia to Maine to Missouri. Uh, Douglas went as far west as Colorado, by the way, in his endless, endless itinerant speaking tours. Did he ever go to California? No. He never made it to California that I know of, and I don't, if he had, I think we'd know. But he went as far west as Colorado. He spoke in Kansas, Nebraska, Missouri. I don't think he made it to Texas. Uh, and I kept trying to, you know, figure out these geographies. He did, of course, go to England three times mm-hmm. and he toured Europe once. Um, and I argue in the book that he may possibly be the most traveled American of the 19th century, just because of, of these, again, constant, the constant demands of his oratorical life. Uh, I think Mark Twain may have traveled further, but not much. Uh, absolutely. Um, did, did you know, it, it was said of Douglas Southall Freeman in his famous biography of Lee that mm-hmm. he knew where Lee was every day of his life, particularly mm-hmm. his adult life. Mm-hmm. Did you know where Douglas was almost every day of his life after he became a speaker in 1841? No, no. Uh, the record of Douglas's life that either he left or one can reconstruct does not get that detail. Uh, you can know where he is most of the time uh, because he's he's either living <clears throat> when when he when he's free he's either living in New Bedford, Massachusetts, Lynn, Massachusetts, or Rochester, New York, all the way to 1872. From that point on, he moved to Washington after his house was burned in Rochester. But because he traveled so much, because his living, his profession was as an itinerant orator, that, that is the principal way he made a living. He also made a living from his writing and from his editing of his newspaper uh, for 16 years. He was actually a great journalist, we need to remember that. Uh, but the travels are constant. And we do have a lot of itineraries of his, his speaking, uh, pretty detailed itineraries, but no, I don't know where he was every day of his life. There were times I kept, I tried to reconstruct individual speaking tours, and you, even with maps, you get out and you realize, my God, he spoke in that little town. That little town today only has one traffic light, but there was a Methodist church, and he spoke in it. If there was a church in a town on all these circuits, Douglas spoke there. In fact, I say in the book that no one can ever prove this, and frankly, does it really matter, but it's entirely likely that more Americans heard Frederick Douglass speak than anyone else in the 19th century. There were lots of itinerant lectures, and there was the Chautauqua circuit. Ralph Waldo Emerson did lots of these tours. Mark Twain did lots of these tours, as did other writers and politicians to some degree, although in those years politicians didn't tend to campaign as widely as they do now. But no one um, traveled the rails, and frankly in stagecoaches and in carriages and even on foot and horseback, as much or as far as Douglas did to spread the word of abolitionism from 1841 to the Civil War, so for the 20 years before the Civil War, and then during the war, he's constantly on the road doing the same. And after the war, when the war was over, he had a little period there of wondering whether what he would do with the rest of his life. He writes about this in retrospect in the last autobiography. He says, he says in 1865, the war was over. They'd won. The victory was won. Emancipation was won. 
And he says, you know, my church broke up. My congregation was gone, meaning abolitionism was apparently falling apart. What would he do, he wondered. Well, it turns out it was a great deal yet for him to do because America had hardly solved the problem of race and slavery. And uh, he gave more speeches after the Civil War <laughs> than he gave before. Um, uh, he was a constantly traveling man, but it needs to be said here that as an orator, he delivered carefully prepared speeches. We have texts of virtually all of them in one form or another. He wasn't just the spontaneous orator who just belted it out from the top of his head. He he could he could speak in the tradition of a black preacher for sure. That's what his early uh, kind of uh, rooting is in. But we have long text of many of these speeches, twenty pages and more, uh, that he would deliver. Now he probably broke from the text at all sorts of stages, but I've always found that fascinating because I believe Douglas was one of those people, and you and I know these kinds of people and we may be that ourselves. He didn't know what he really thought until he wrote it down. Uh, and, uh, when there was a crisis, a big pivot in history, a catastrophe or a victory or whatever, Douglas would go to his desk and write about it. It might end up an editorial in his paper. It might end up a speech. And then he would take that speech out on the road. He was somebody who had to write. And he wrote millions of words and he wrote in almost every genre which people do find quite remarkable because he never had a day of formal education in his life um, he wrote he, he even wrote one novella in 1852 called The Heroic Slave he, he tried poetry and he wrote a fair amount of poems it, it actually wasn't his best mode however <laughs> But in, auto, in, auto, in autobiography, in short-form political editorials, and then, of course, in the speeches, he became, and I do think this is his most lasting legacy, he became a genius with words, a genius with language. Um, Douglas had that ability. It's a rare ability. And it is why I employ the word prophet in the title of this book. He had that rare ability to capture in phrasing, in words, sometimes sentences, sometimes whole paragraphs, sometimes whole essays, the meaning of an event, the meaning of a moment, the meaning of a dilemma, the meaning of a crisis. He had that capacity of prophets, not of predicting what's going to happen. That's a kind of profane definition of what a prophet is. The prophet as Abraham Heschel, the great Jewish theologian, wrote, and I quote Heschel in the book, a prophet is that person who can find the words and speak them or write them one octave higher than the rest of us can quite grasp. It's that person who finds the words to help us understand what we're doing, what we're feeling, what we're experiencing. And it's why when people read Douglas, they find sometimes... His writings just, just smack them between the eyes and they just sort of wake up. And there are all these aphorisms that we could, we could trot out, uh, whether it's about slavery or it's about race itself or it's about politics or it's about um, war and peace or it's about the great issues of Reconstruction um, or, for that matter, even about moral philosophy and the meaning of life. Douglas was a philosophical thinker who thought in the words he heard in his head and uh, I, I, you've read the book and you know this, I make this idea of his power with words a central theme in the book. There's several big themes, but I make it throughout that he became a person of words. Words were indeed the only real weapon Douglas ever had. He never held elective office. He never had great power. But he did have the power of the voice and the pen. And words were something that had been denied to him, just to orient our listeners. As a child, for sure. He, his life spanned virtually the entire 19th century. Right. He was born in 1818, right. we think February, I believe, right? right? right. In 1818. It was February. We, we, we know to an enslaved black woman and, we think, yeah. a white father. 
Well, there's no question, I think, that his father was white, and he always was told and believed it was probably one of his two masters or two owners. Whose uh, names were? Well, the first was Aaron Anthony, whom I think is probably the best candidate for his father, although Douglas never knew, and we don't know yet either. The other was Thomas Auld, uh, to whom Douglas was assigned because Auld was a relative of Anthony's, and when Anthony died, all of his slaves were divided up. Um, yeah, he's born in an in a absolute backwater of the American slave society. He's born along a little horseshoe bend in the Tuckahoe River on the eastern shore of Maryland, probably in his grandmother Betsy Bailey's cabin. She had five daughters, Harriet Bailey, uh, Douglas's mother, was one of them. Um, and Harriet Bailey, I, if I'm remembering correctly, had five children herself. Um, he really didn't know his mother. He had these vague memories of her, but he had to kind of invent memories of his mother. He saw her last when he was five years old. He never really knew who his father was, so that's one of the first facts one should know about Douglas, is that he was, he was in, in every way an orphan. Not, didn't know his parentage, didn't know anything called family. Uh, never knew anything called home until, to some extent, he was sent to Baltimore uh, to be the playmate of a little white boy who was the nephew of his owner, then Thomas Auld. And it was Sophia Auld, uh, the mistress of the house, uh, the wife of Hugh Auld, Thomas Auld's brother, who first taught Douglas his letters, his alphabet, when he's uh, seven and eight years old. And for reasons that are partly mysterious, but not entirely mysterious, he just took to language. He took to reading. He took to collecting words any way he could. If it was shreds of paper he found in the street or magazines and, and newspapers that he found. They tried to deny this to him, that is, they being Hugh Auld, uh, when he found out that this little boy was learning to read so well and Douglas describes in the autobiography Hugh Auld walking in one day when he's about eight years old, or maybe nine, and sees his wife teaching this kid more reading and reading out loud with him. Douglas says the Auld stopped him, said, if you teach that N-word to read, the next thing you'll want to do is learn how to write, and uh, you must stop doing that, and so on. And Douglas later, always the ironist, Douglas said, well, that was the first anti-slavery speech I ever heard. If, if, if this business of words and language was so important to these people, I, don't, I need to go get some more of that. <laughs> and then he encounters little white boys in the streets of Baltimore when he's 8, 9, 10 years old, and they're all carrying this little reader they have in the school. It's actually not that little. It's almost 300 pages. It's called The Columbian Orator. And that became the first book Douglas ever owned. He got his own copy when he's about 11 from a, little, from a bookstore on Thames Street in Fells Point in Baltimore. Um, he got his own copy of this extraordinary book. It was the second largest school reader in the United States, next to the McGuffey Reader. It was published over some 55 or 60 years in some 27 editions. It was accumulated um, by a man named Caleb Bingham, who was a New England uh, teacher, schoolmaster. And it consists of, first, dozens and dozens of speeches, orations, uh, from both classical times, the Greeks and Romans, but also especially from the Enlightenment. Some of them, quite openly, anti-slavery. It also has some dialogues in it uh, that Caleb Bingham invented himself. There's even one dialogue Douglas especially remembered where a slave uh, convinces his master to free him. And to a child, why not? What a story. But most importantly, that book had a 20-page introduction that is, in effect, a manual of oratory. It's how-to. It's, it's how do you gesture? How do you, how do you modulate your voice? How do you move your shoulders and your arms? And it has, it has a piece of moral philosophy in the oratory manual, which is really kind of right out of Aristotle, although Douglas didn't need to read Aristotle, but it's this idea that the true orator must have a moral force, a moral point. 
must reach his audience with the verve not only of his voice, but of his ideas. And when you read that manual of oratory in the Columbian Order, which Douglas seized upon, you begin to realize, uh aha, this is where this kid began to think about oratory, or began to think about speaking, or using words and using language. During his teenage years, when he's sent back to the eastern shore, and he's treated like a field hand, and he's brutalized at one point by an overseer named Covey, he ends up the next year on a plantation owned by a man named Freeland. And on that Freeland farm, uh, they, they all got treated better. But Douglas would run what he called a Sabbath school on Sundays when they didn't have to work. And he would go with what he called his band of brothers, a group of guys. Uh, and he, he apparently was the only literate one among them. But he, they'd go out in a brush arbor, they'd go out under some trees, and Douglas would teach them oratory, he said from this book, and he would read aloud from the Bible. He's like 16, 17 years old doing this. That's a form of power. If a kid finds, any kid, a kid finds something he can do well, that's, whether it's sports or whether it's with his mind or some other way, he's going to want to exercise that. He even hatched a plot with this band of brothers to escape. They got caught, of course. Uh, It was a terrible plan. They were going to steal some boats and row up the Chesapeake Bay to Baltimore, they thought. They got caught. He was thrown in jail. Uh, He put in chains for two weeks and believed, probably, that he would be sold south uh, for money. But Thomas Auld one day came into that cell and said, I'm sending you back to Baltimore. Uh, and on your 21st birthday, I may free you if you have good behavior. Now, as we know, Douglas didn't entirely believe that promise, and he will escape at age 20. But by that time, he not only had that Colombian order in his pocket, and when he escaped from slavery, he had only two possessions. And he had the sailor suit that he was wearing. In one pocket, he had a little bit of cash. In the other pocket, he had his Colombian order. That is the only thing he owned. And that very copy today is at Cedar Hill, the National Park site, Douglas's home in Washington, D.C. They'll get it out for special guests, I guess. And I got to hold it once with white gloves on, the actual copy Douglas owned, and it was a Maryland edition of that book. Mm -hmm. Think about it, Maryland was a slave state, and they Mm -hmm. published this book. But at any rate, language was already, before he ever escapes from slavery, words, sermons, books, were the thing that, that he most wanted to see, hear, and do. And while he was a slave in Baltimore, he lived in a, a very, he lived amidst a very large free black community. It, it sounds odd to some people, but the Baltimore he escaped from in 1838, had about 130,000 people. Baltimore was a huge ocean port. It was a great shipbuilding port. It had about 3,000 slaves, you know, fairly small number, most of them you know, occupying Fells Point and down along the wharfs, but it had about 17,000 free blacks. Now, they lived circumscribed lives. They had few, if any, rights, but they were free. And they had their own kind of underground economy, and they had their own churches. He names four churches he attended while he was still a slave, two white and two black. He names the preachers. He tells you which ones he liked best and so on. He heard sermonic language. During his youth, he read it in the Columbian Order. And, very importantly, to your question about words and language, he met this old preacher in Baltimore named Charles Lawson. He called him alternately Uncle Lawson or Father Lawson. And Lawson was a, he was a drayman. You know, he drove a cart by day, but he was a man obsessed with the Bible. But he didn't read very well. He loved the biblical stories. But when he found Douglas at age 13, 14, 15... Douglas would sit with him whenever they had time together. He even described sitting on the stoop of old Lawson's like cabin. And he would have Douglas just read out loud from the Bible. Just, just over and over, read the stories of the Old Testament. 
The language Douglas got in his head, I'm convinced of this, the language he comes out of slavery with in his mind uh, is born of the King James language of the Bible, is born of those cadences of the Bible. And I've often told students uh, when I have them read Douglas's narrative, the first autobiography, I tell them, go off by yourself and just start reading it out loud. Uh, or read, read it to your friend. Two of you get together, perform it, read it out loud. It's sermonic. And, and because that's where he got language from. Plus, by the time he wrote it in 1845, he'd been out on the abolitionist circuit for almost four years telling those stories oratorically. His language was first oratorical. Then he became a writer. And eventually he becomes both. Um, but, so he didn't just come out of slavery, uh, this well-formed orator. Uh, and he certainly didn't come out of slavery a, a formed writer yet at all. That takes time. But he, he came out of slavery with this passion for words and language and books of any kind he could get, storytelling. Uh, and lo and behold, when he and his then wife Anna got to New Bedford, Massachusetts, within the first year they're there, he not only joins the local AME Zion Church, the black church, this little church, they called it Little Zion in New Bedford. By the time he's 21, they have him preaching. I mean, they just decide, somehow they discover this kid can, this kid can preach. And um, for the next couple of years, he's, he's technically ordained. He's 21, 22, and 23 years old. He's preaching. And that's, in effect, where he is discovered, as they say, uh, by some white abolitionists and uh, gets invited in August of 1841 out to Nantucket for this big anti-slavery convention run by William Lloyd Garrison and the Massachusetts Anti-Slavery Society. And it's there on Nantucket in 1841 that he gives really two speeches to this entirely white audience of abolitionists. And he's essentially just telling his own story, but he, uh, he knocked their socks off. And immediately he was hired, and they took him out on the circuit as an itinerant orator. He still had a lot to learn about all of this. But uh, the man of words was already going to be a man of words by the time he got out of slavery. And what you're telling us is he, he's a man of words. We still have his words, Written down, mm. we have his mm. photographs. You say mm. he is probably the most photographed American of the 19th century. Mm. What we don't have mm. is his voice. Two questions here. <laughs> number one, do we know what he sounded like? And number mm. two, one of the things I was fascinated about in your book, toward the end of his life, and he mm. died in 1895 in February, mm. uh, is that he heard phonograph yeah, he records, and he was... Right before he died. Fascinated by yeah, it. Yeah. As far as we know, he never made a recording of his own voice. He That's just right. missed that, right? Right. Well, he could have been recorded. Uh, he, he lived to the age of mm -hmm. you know, recording devices, the phonograph. Um, but the reason I don't think he ever was is because of this letter that, that you saw. Uh, he goes to dinner. It's only like three months or four months before he died. Mm. He goes to dinner one night at this man's house in Washington whose name was Anderson. And afterward, he writes a letter. It's a thank you letter for dinner, kind of thing none of us do anymore. <laughs> but most of the letter is thanking him for playing the phonograph, because on the phonograph he had heard the voice of a minister he knew well, a man named Weirs. And Douglas was just stunned to hear his friend's voice recorded. And in the letter he talks about, can it be possible? Well, he calls it a divine invention. It's, it's magical. And he says, you know, can the human voice live forever? You know, and you hear him thinking of himself there. So if he'd ever been recorded, he wouldn't have written that letter. And it's a shame. It's, just, it's actually surprising that the, the device was around. Why didn't Anderson try to record him that night? I don't know. Um, but we do have to your other part of the question, lots of written descriptions of Douglas speaking, lots of them. In fact, a lot of those are in the Evans collection. There are descriptions of what he sounded like, what he looked like, uh, his presence on a stage, many descriptions of how he had a baritone voice, but how he could modulate the voice. Uh, he was also quite a mimic. Uh, 
I mean, he learned to be quite a performer um, on the abolitionist circuit. Uh, so we're talking about a, a baritone voice that he clearly could project, because obviously there are no microphones in the 19th century. I also have lots of uh, clippings and evidence, even from his own letters, of him frequently losing his voice, terrible problems with sore throats. Well, any speaker does, any orator is, especially when you're out there, often outdoors and broad daylight, uh, belting it out with your own vocal cords. Um, so he never was recorded. However, he loved all those devices of modernity. Uh, it's, it's, it's very interesting. You mentioned he lives the whole trajectory of the 19th century. I like to, to remind my readers and audiences that he's born in 1818 before steamboats are out there on the rivers, before the telegraph, before the railroad, before the rotary press, those great elements of early 19th century modernity, all of which he would build his life around. The rotary press, the telegraph, the trains and steamships, but then he lives all the way to electric light bulbs, even the first telephones, and even the phonograph, and a whole lot of other modern gadgets that are appearing. Electricity. Electricity. Uh, so he lives that whole trajectory, and he was fascinated with steamships, the speed of steamships, um, and all the rest, which everyone probably was, but if you were a traveling person as much as he was, how could you not be? Uh, the transportation revolution helped him make his life. The communications revolution helped him make a career. Uh, he still had to create the words himself. But one of the things I do think is sometimes forgotten about Douglas is that for 16 years he edited his own newspaper. Uh, first as a, a, a weekly, and then toward the end, the last three years or so during the war years, as a monthly. And then he created a, yet another paper after the war called The New National Era, which he ran for three years with his sons in Washington, although it failed on him. Um, but in, in his, pre, his pre-war papers were called what? The first was The North Star. He created it at the end of 1847. Then he changed the name in the early 50s to Frederick Douglass's paper. He put his own name on it. Then in 59 or 60, he changed it to the Douglas Monthly. Uh, uh, he, he, uh, he understood his own brand, although they never used the word brand in the 19th century. Right. He understood branding. Right. <laughs> Two things I'm struck by, especially, among a thousand other things, in reading your book. Mm. Uh, many of the things that Douglas did in his life would have been dangerous for an African American in the 20th century. Right. Someone as outspoken, someone yeah. as threatening to white people right. and their institutions as he was. And yet throughout the antebellum period, from 1841 through 1865, mm -hmm. he travels widely, he mm -hmm. travels alone, mm -hmm. he travels mostly in what we think of today as the upper Midwest and mm -hmm. the North, but yeah. he's still traveling into places that would not be safe and saying yeah. things like slavery is evil and slaveholders yeah. are the devil. Yeah. Yeah. And after the war, he travels everywhere. He's a brave man. Yeah. Well, I think all the abolitionists were. In the early years, they t he tended to travel in troops, groups. They'd travel three, four, five together at once. They'd ride in stagecoaches together and so on. Um, but much of his travel the rest of his life was indeed alone. Um, part of the purpose of anti-slavery meetings and gatherings and speeches was to trouble an audience, uh, to trouble their conscience, uh, to trouble them politically, uh, to get reactions. And sometimes those reactions were physical and, and violent. And he was attacked many, many, many times. He was thrown off railway cars. He was railway cars. He was thrown out of restaurants and hotels. He was Jim Crowed more times in his life than he could ever count. Um, and he was attacked physically. Uh, there are a few famous cases. Uh, he got into a, just a mob uh, riot in Pendleton, Indiana in 1843. He's still a very young guy then. He's 20, good Lord, he's 25, 25 years old. And a mob attacked this uh, makeshift stage out in the, out in the countryside. And, and it became an all-out rumble. He broke his wrist. Uh, there's one report that he was knocked unconscious. I'm not sure that's true, but he did give the credit to a fellow abolitionist named William White, 
whom he says saved his life, by dragging him out of the scene, putting him in the back of a carriage, and they drove him away. Uh, but many, many other times he's attacked with what they always called brick bats, which meant stones or whatever people threw. He's attacked with rotten eggs at times. He even had a live pig thrown in it once in a, in a church. <laughs> I don't know, that might have been a badge of honor or something. But people didn't tend to carry guns, to be frank about it, in the 19th century. Doesn't mean they didn't own guns, hunting rifles especially. But they didn't tend to travel with guns. There's, it's the rarest, rarest exception that we have a report of abolitionists being shot at. The most famous one was Elijah Lovejoy in 1837 out in Alton, Illinois, who was indeed shot to death. Mm-hmm. Uh, mobs would attack abolitionists, but I guess we can say, luckily, not with guns. Now, he was attacked so many times in print as well as in person. There was a sense, though, and he learned this in part from William Lloyd Garrison and the radical anti-slavery movement, that part of the function and purpose of abolitionists, and this carries on even after the war to a great extent, was to trouble the audience to get them to respond, to, to find, to penetrate their conscience. And if that's what you're trying to do, you're going to get reactions. But it is, it is a bit surprising that uh, a person like Douglas traveling as far and as often as he did wasn't attacked even, even more. However, I should say that after the war, even in remote places, even traveling across the upper Midwest, uh, and after, in about the 1870s, 1880s, he traveled even much further west. He went as far as Kansas, Nebraska, and even Colorado at one point. Um, he becomes, in every sense of the word, a famous man. I mean, in fact, I make a, a pretty big theme in the book out of the problem of fame. And, uh, and we'd call it celebrity today. They didn't tend to use that word, but he had a terrible problem with fame. He couldn't go anywhere without being recognized, es- especially after his image appeared on the cover of Harper's Magazine and all the, 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 the most, co- and then the New York Herald Tribune and you know the most common publications in the country had lithographs. They couldn't print photographs, but they could do lithographs of photographs. And Douglas's image was everywhere. Uh, and here again, the clippings in the Evans collection was so valuable because a lot of them are just descriptions of Douglas. People, people describe him the first time I saw Douglas or you know, the second time I saw Douglas or what he sounded like and so on. Um, and that's both part of his purpose. You know, he, he wants people to come hear him and everywhere he goes they want to. But he's also got to live with that. Uh, living with that kind of fame became a terrible burden for him. And he did need to find ways to escape. Uh, His escape primarily was to go home when he could uh, to Cedar Hill in in Washington, uh, where he lives after 1878. Uh, The last about uh, um, 17, nearly 18 years of his life, he lived in this big house up on a hill in Washington, D.C., which did become his retreat, his enclave. Although when there, as I may have hinted earlier, he has this huge extended family dependent on him. Uh, His daughter had six children, and and, and at any given time, most of them were living at Cedar Hill. I believe he had 21 grandchildren? 21 grandchildren. Five children or four? He had five children, four of whom lived to adulthood. The the daughter named Annie, uh, his wife Anna's namesake, died at age 11 in 1860 in a diphtheria epidemic, uh, which was a harbinger of many things to come, because about half of Douglas's grandchildren died in their youth, their infancy youth, or even teenage years. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a turbulent, extraordinary life where you have to, as a biographer, and this is true of most biographies, but in Douglas's case, you have to find that balance between the public and the private. You have to go there. You you can't leave the private life out. Otherwise, it's not it's not a real biography. It's not fair. It's not honest. It's not history. Uh, but there you have a dilemma because Douglas, though he wrote twelve hundred pages of autobiography, he almost never writes about his two marriages, his children, his domestic world, his private life. He's just not going to go there. Which is common to the nineteenth century. People didn't write 
tell-all memoirs in the 19th century. But you have to find other ways, indirectly, and under and over, to get to that more private sensibility in Douglas's life. And happily, we do have enough letters, family letters, that allow us some access to that. Uh, not enough. It's, it's really one of the two or three great frustrations in working on Douglas. You want to get... You wanna get you want to get closer to that relationship he has with Anna, his first wife, for 44 years. You want to get even closer to some other key relationships he has with women. And even more so to me, the relationships with his children, the three sons, his daughter. It was not easy to be Frederick Douglass' son and daughter uh, for a host of reasons, the fame being one of them, the brilliance, but also his absence. He's absent for long periods of their youth. Uh, they know him as the famous man who would come home. Um, they loved him. I mean, they adored him. And these scrapbooks are such physical living evidence of that. I, I found myself shaking my head at times thinking, these guys put so much energy to collecting their father's life. No wonder they were having struggles in their own lives. <laughs> They gave so much to basically recording their father that maybe they didn't work on their own lives enough. Well, the, you and I could talk about this for the next two hours because there's, there's so much in this book to get to. His second marriage to a white woman oh, and yeah. what that was like in the 19th century. The most century. scandalous marriage of the 19th century. Right. And, and his, his, one, of the, one of the things that I was struck by was his use of humor when he spoke oh, yeah. to white audiences oh, yeah, yeah. throughout the antebellum period, but afterwards mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. uh, I mentioned his bravery, uh, mm -hmm. the, the world traveling that he did, mm -hmm. uh, and we don't have time to talk about it. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's all in your book, which comes to 764 pages of text, <laughs> 888 pages with notes and bibliography, mm -hmm. and I've read every word of it, David. It is an outstanding towering achievement of, of mm. historical biography. I congratulate you on it. Well, thank um, you, Stan. I am honored to have you as a reader, i got to tell you that. Well, I appreciate that. I should mention <laughs> that David is also here in Savannah to become the inaugural Vincent J. Dooley Distinguished Fellow, which is a new program the Georgia Historical Society is doing. He will be inducted into that this evening. David, good luck with the book tour. This book is going to win many prizes, <laughs> all well-deserved. Thank you for all you've done for not only the Georgia Historical Society, but for all of us for giving us this extraordinary story. Well, thanks, Stan, and I'm very honored to be here. Uh, again, I'm just honored to have you as a reader. That concludes our interview with historian David White about his latest book, Frederick Douglass, Prophet of Freedom, published in 2018 by Simon & Schuster. The interview was recorded in Savannah at the Jefferson House Education Center at the Georgia Historical Society on November 8, 2018. The hardest working engineer in show business, now also the czar of our Tallahassee office, as well as the captain of the GHS Under-40 soccer team, is our very own Brendan Cannonball Crellin. Our mailman this week and every week is Crimson Tide fan extraordinaire, one Gary F. Taylor, born and raised, that's right, who is away this week attending the Banana Split Festival in Wilmington, Ohio, but he promises to be back next week. Our legal counsel this week and every week is provided by the law offices of Gallup and Taylor, where their motto is, Honest, Professional, Affordable. Hey, two out of three ain't bad. Catering this week provided by Hagee's House of Tacos, home of Big Al's Microwave, Burma Shave, Cradle to Grave, Oh Behave, Blue suede, concave, specially engraved, buy three and save, explode like a hand grenade, I wouldn't touch it if I were Bobby Flay, drippy enchilada. If you have an iPhone, you can find our podcast at the App Store or on the podcast app on your phone. If you have an Android, look for us at Google Play. Tell your friends and family because everyone is going to want to hear David Blight. You can find out everything about the Georgia Historical Society and the Duly Distinguished Teaching Fellows Program at georgiahistory.com and the Georgia History Festival at georgiahistoryfestival.org. Please also check out my blog and similarly painful podcast, except for when I have a guest star, at deatonpath.georgiahistory.com. If you have any comments about this show or about life in general, drop me a line at sdeaton at georgiahistory.com. 
As always, thank you very much for listening. We hope you'll come back next week. So long, everybody.